on this first one, this is the donor, uh, who doesn't look totally comfortable at all in this. Uh, man, don't worry about the name. It's Peter Bronkhorst, B-R-O-N-C-K-H-O-R-S-T. And people think that might be his father over here. Uh, anyway, what happened was that, um, and this is quite a famous scene in the kind of the um, providing proof, if you like, for Catholic dogma. Uh, this thing called transubstantiation. And if you look, if you know your Raphael, one of the in one of the great rooms uh, in the Vatican, uh, the Pope's private apartments, the, the Stanze, S-T-A-N-Z-E, uh, the great disputa, the disputation over. The, the idea of transubstantiation, which was simply that during the celebration of the Mass, the bread, the wine become miraculous in the body and the blood of Christ. Because that's, you know, during, remember the Last Supper? Takes the bread, takes the wine, this is my body, this is my blood, eat, drink this in remembrance of me. So the, the, that's what the Protestants said. And the, the, the Catholics, right, the Protestants said, nah, it's just symbolic. And so this was a very hot issue at this time. And that's why the Pope Julius II sort of put his stamp of approval on the idea of transubstantiation. But the proof of it essentially was that a particular priest was celebrating Mass, and I think he may have had, uh, no, it's, it's Gregory the Great, that's who it is, who is one of the, you know, the superstar folks from 6th century or so. Uh, anyway, the, as he's celebrating Mass, the actual body and blood of Christ miraculously appear above the altar, uh, again providing proof positive that transubstantiation works. So that's what's happening on the outside of the thing. On the inside, uh, again, what we have are, uh, well, first of all, the donors appearing on the outside wings. That's Peter Bronkhorst and his, and his lady wife on this side. Uh, in the background, I have to zoom in a bit on this because um, Peter Bronkhorst, so he has St. Peter, we've seen that before, St. So Peter right there. Um, in the, and there's also, actually, quite zoom in enough, but there's all sorts of weird, strange stuff happening in the landscape. And most of it doesn't seem to be all that nice. Uh, but there's it in the background here, uh, and we've seen the idea of ruined stables, all that sort of thing, again perhaps suggesting the ruins of the palace of David where Christ was born. That has to be Joseph, who's looking kind of dodgy in the background. Oh, sorry. He's, he's, um, he, he's drying diapers in front of the fire. And looking a little bit ashamed, it's not exactly manly work, so he's looking a little bit dodgy. But he's also wearing black and white, which is Dominican yet again. It looks like, I just know there's a toad over the door, so that's sort of the gateway to evil. Come on in, the little fellow saying there. And, and there's also, I mean, there's millions of other little bits and pieces if you can get the time and zoom in close enough to look at all this stuff. Anyway, that's, that's Peter. Uh, and on the other side, his, his wife's name was Agnes. So she gets to be with Saint Agnes, who we've met a couple of times before. Remember her, Agnes in Latin, Agnus, the Lamb. So that's her symbol there, uh, with the shepherd's crook just in front of that. Uh, above her is a, uh, a woodpecker pecking away. Not sure if I'm going any further. Well, I'll tell you a bit. Uh, so that was a symbol of heresy. Don't know why, but it is. And behind that, again, it's sort of rather dangerous. There's somebody being chewed up by a wild animal of some kind. There's a woman being chased by it, looks like a wolf or something there. So again, it's all a little bit, you know, the world is a scary place, basically. Uh, and this, if, if we look at the center of the, this is the, the central panel in the back. But what, what, this is, should be I thought, Bethlehem or maybe Jerusalem. But it's a pretty spiffy looking place. I mean, it's vaguely Indian, very vaguely Indian, uh, sort of suggesting exotic, just sort of architecture from away. Uh, very eclectic. I mean, throwing a windmill, which is about as Dutch as you can get into the middle of it. But there are also these sort of marauding armies. See, there's people charging there, there's other people coming from the other direction. So all oh, hell is going to break loose in a bit. Uh, and there are, look, see, there's a, little, there's a little crescent moon on top of that. Uh -oh. Um, people lurking in the woods over there. So again, it's very ominous somehow. So in other words, sort of trust your faith in what's going on in the foreground. It's all, again, wonderful propaganda stuff to get you to believe and get you to behave. More marauding armies, even just in right behind the central scene, you can see that. So zooming in on the, on the, on the main scene, 
I mean, at first glance, when we don't look all that closely, it looks relatively straightforward because we've seen at least 123 adorations of the kings already. Uh, and, and, and this is um, a little bit standard in some way, because even the, the format, well, we've seen that over and over again, of the, of the ruined stable, the symbolism of that being propped up by a not very successful column there, uh, and the kings sort of lining up old, middle, young, and I mean that might almost vaguely put you in mind of something like the, even the sort of, you know, the angle of the stable of the Olivet of Robert Compan, mm, sort of. And the, look, just even the angle of the Madonna and Child could put you a little bit in mind of the uh, of the Van Eyck Roland Madonna. Doesn't have to. But whatever it is, I mean, this is really stripped out and weird. And, I mean, it's the, it's the oddest looking little project. If I'm a king, I'm not doing anything for him, I don't think. Uh, held in the little clock. And she's very kind of stripped down, bare bones, no frills kind of Madonna. Uh, I mean, it's all sort of strange and difficult and different in, in, in many, many ways. Uh, but it does, I mean, it suggests that Bosch knew what was going on in other places, who copies and whatever, of, of, of sort of certain fairly standardized uh, compositions. So that's about as ordinary as it gets, really. And then you look at the absolutely magnificent, I and mean, this is really quite extraordinary and lovely, the figure of Caspar, the youngest of the kings. Again, yeah, we've seen that several times recently, uh, of being, he represents Africa, so he's black, with this amazing costume, very exotic, and there's sort of a mini, Servant in behind with bits of fruit and veg and things running around there. Look at all this amazing stuff going on here. I mean, sometimes you think of Bosch as being rather kind of schematic, but he knows how to do detail when he really wants to. Exactly what these bird like human headed creatures are, no idea, but anyway. But it's also kind of spiffy fashion wise as well. You should all wear something nice like that. And you can see what his Christmas present is. Uh, well, maybe, because, um, no, it's, uh, I didn't have the details, it was back in, uh, it might be, uh, well, it, it's somebody paying <coughs> tribute to David, you don't have to worry about who it is, uh, somebody clever figured that one out, but on top of it is this rather skinny bird, and it, I, I, I don't quite know, people say it's a pelican, but it's got a little seed in its mouth, we saw it before, birds, uh, little pecking seeds out of luscious fruit, things like that. Uh, but anyway, if it's a pelican, not sure if we, oh, we did meet one very briefly in the back of behind God on the Ghent altar. It's a pelican, a symbol of the crucifixion, believed that it pecks its breast, feeds its young with its own blood, so like Christ shedding his blood for us, that sort of idea. Uh, so, I don't know, whatever it is, it's obviously been something, but it's rather a nice bird. Uh, when you travel across to the, to the, the middle uh, figure of Melchior, um, if you can see, of that, it's, I mean, it's this wonderfully ornamented robe that he wore. This is actually quite a well-known scene of, of King Solomon, the wise man. But remember the Solomon throne of Solomon, thing like that. And this is the Queen of Sheba, uh, who was a, well, she's a hugely mysterious character. There was a, a big exhibition about her in the British Museum in London a few years ago. They still never quite pinned her down. Where it might come from Ethiopia or somewhere like that. Anyway, in the Bible, in the Old Testament, she comes all the way up to Jerusalem to sort of share the wisdom of Solomon, but bearing gifts, as you would. So that is a kind of prefiguration, if you like, of the three kings bringing Christmas presents to Christ. Uh, all on the, on the well, beautiful face, isn't it? I mean, terrifically well done. Uh, and then there's other, uh, frankly, I can't think of that, yeah, sort of basically sacrifice stuff going on down there. And then the old, nice old, um, who's the other one? Um, Balthazar. Nice old, decrepit Balthazar, remember the three ages of man, basically. And his gifts are on the ground, you can't zoom in on that. Um, unfortunately, because they represent, well, on his helmet, they, it represents sort of scenes of lust which are sins to be put aside, if you, particularly when you're coming into the presence of the, of the, the Christ child. Uh, and that, I'm not sure if you can see that, what's going on there. That's actually the, the sacrifice of Isaac. Well, we've met that a couple of times. Remember, poor old Isaac, mean, ancient Isaac, ancient wife, can't have babies, finally does have this wonderful little boy called Isaac. And he grows up, he's a few years old, and God says, well, awfully sorry, but you're going to have to kill him. And that, you know, the whole sacrifice of Isaac thing, last second reprieve. 
and that not sort of seen as a prefiguration of, of God sacrificing his son. It's like a different result. Anyway, when you see that, you think of, again, you think forward to uh, the crucifix, so on and on and on, uh, more and more stuff sort of happening. But this, the weird stuff, in a way, starts in the background, uh, because there's a very dodgy-looking fellow, again with piercings, lurking around with some dodgier-looking friends, and he's got a silly expression on his face. And again, he's hard to pin down. People think that he might be the, the Antichrist. Because the, the point about the Antichrist, he was supposed to show up just before Judgment Day and sort of seduce the people of the earth into following him rather than the real Christ. So there's a kind of pattern of like even the, you know, the parallel universe in a sense. The, the Last Supper is sort of equated to the Black Mass. And so Christ, Antichrist. Uh, the sort of yin and yang, if you want to put it that way, anyway. And, and he, as I say, he's flanked by all sorts of weird looking, dangerous characters there. And his Christmas present is, well, is that's what it is, sort of upside down. I just revised it, and that's it. I frankly have got no idea what's going on. Uh, if any of you writing your papers about this, it shouldn't, it shouldn't be too hard to find out. But somebody's catching birds and doing weird things. So, anyway, whatever it is, I'm sure it's very meaningful. Uh, other people actually want him to be King Herod, who's lurking in the bushes, basically, sort of waiting to check up on the sort of baby who's been born. I think that doesn't make too much sense to me somehow, but uh, whatever it is, <coughs> he adds an element. We're, that's something we have never set, seen ever in an adoration of the king's scene before. So again, that kind of novelty. The other thing is, look at this very, very rickety stable. Uh, being propped up by, I mean, normally we've seen that sort of strong column for fortitude and everything else. This isn't going to do a very good job there. And it looks like it's just going to come all crashing down in a second because these idiot shepherds are climbing up on top of the roof. Even they're sort of in the melancholia, knives through hats, again, I'm not sure, bagpipes go. Uh, more people are coming up, you know, so that's for sure going to collapse. And look at this, look at that, it's almost like a death's head peering through the hole in the wall here, with another face just in behind him. I mean, you've only got six inches to pop your head around the other side, so I'm not sure why you have to peer through there, but it's almost like it's, a, it's an imprisoned figure somehow. And then you get a relatively normal type face back there, kind of, kind of a happy thing, happy figure, just sort of looking in and, you know, he's had the brains look around the corner rather than look through the, uh, the grill work there somehow. So everything is very unsettling. It's a, it's a difficult picture. The other ones have been all positive and, you know, hail the Savior, this sort of idea. Uh, and now questions and worries and doubts being reflected everywhere. Particularly, as I said, in the landscape, this is a very dangerous place to be. As it is here, inside and outside, this is the second of the big three. And I'll, just, I'll, start, I'll, do, I'll do the outside and then we'll have our break. Uh, so it's called the Hay Wayne Triptych. Hay, H A Y, Wayne, W A I N, Triptych. Why it's called, th there is no such word as Wayne in the English language. Only this painting, and there's a famous painting by John Consumer in England called the Hay Wayne. I mean, I've never heard it say, oh, look, there's a Wayne coming down the street towards. It's a wagon. But you can't call this the hay wagon trip, you have to call it the hay wane trip, trip, so I'm afraid, sorry about that. Uh, it's the good old English language. Uh, it's about 55 inches high, four and a half feet high or so. Um, again, there's more than one, there's one, the main mountain's in the Prada, the other one's in the Escorial, this huge palace that Philip II built out of the countryside. Uh, they, it was always dated around 1490, but they did dendrochronology on it recently. You know, where they can actually a test the, it's like DNA or whatever. You know, they can test the age of the wood, and and now it's dated, I think, after 1510. So anyway, I, oh, here's the centimeter, 140 by 100 centimeters or so. So I'm looking at the outset, fold up the wings, and this is this is what we're going to, going to see is the the typical format. It, you, you you start in paradise, Garden of Eden, you go to Earth. This is today with all of our stupidities. And then you go to hell. And there's, there's no rest. I mean, 
it's unavoidable. There's no heaven at the, at the, you know, for the good people. Uh, but the outside is rather a nice one because it's one is again closing the images up, uh, and this is one of those. Again, it shows how there's absolutely no agreement about Bosch's work, what things actually mean, because there's a figure, as you can see, uh, very warily making his way through this extraordinary dangerous landscape. Here are the gallows, and you know, for executing people, uh, somebody bad playing bagpipes. People dancing, which in this context is bad, or they're either dancing or he's dragging you off to the bushes, I'm not sure, maybe both. Uh, and other people being tied to trees and killed and robbed, and, uh, it's just not good. Time. So he, and, and bad dogs uh, going on, and, 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 and rickety bridges, earlier travelers, animals, whatever, you know, it's not Adam in this case, it's just, you know, just, you know, the ominous quality of both of them. And he has been identified as being, I wouldn't try to write all this down, um, the prodigal son, uh, the errant fool, just somebody wandering around being a bit stupid, uh, the vagabond, the peddler, the drunkard, Saturn, the planet, you know, in his personification, uh, the personification of sloth, which is sort of, you know, laziness, one of the seven deadly sins, melancholy, if it's, it's possibly something to do with poverty, you know, he's got holes in his knees and things like that, uh, and he doesn't own much. Presumably that's his entire material world strapped to his back. Um, poverty was one of the, the virtues um, extolled by the Franciscan monks, who I don't think, I don't think Bosch ever goes after the Franciscans. But this was to counteract the virtue of, uh, you know, of, 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 of greed, of avarice. And avarice is all what's going to, we're going to be seeing what's happening on the inside. Avarice, one of course, one of the seven deadly sins. Uh, so I think all, so all of them, you can't really pin him down in some way. I think he, he might just be us. He might just be every man, every woman, if you like. A kind of pilgrim's progress, traveling through this incredibly dangerous landscape. Uh, and whether or not he'll survive, you just don't know. I mean, you know you're, sort of, you're rooting for him, but not absolutely sure. So anyway, that's the outside. So actually, since you're mostly here, let me just, and if you didn't pick up your midterm, do that there. I, I, just because I know you're all come traipsing back in late on, not at all. So let me just say a couple of things about the midterm. Uh, because, I mean, as I said, they were almost exactly average for every other midterm it always is. Uh, and don't forget, if you didn't get a terrifically good mark, it's only worth 20% of the final total, so there's lots of time to do better. Uh, one little Practical thing, please write your full name, don't just write your nicknames, because some, some of you have very exotic Asian names, and then you put what your friends call you here, and, and it's not the same as what's on. So on the final exam, put your name as it appears on the class sheet. That helps me try to figure out who's who. Uh, what the TA said was mostly, um, the, the more you said, obviously, the more you got, mark-wise. Uh, and so she was looking for more detailed answers. Sometimes it's, she thought you almost assumed that because she knew the answers, you didn't actually have to say it, which isn't how it works. I mean, you, e even some of the ones like, you know, like the Arnofini wedding or something, I said, you know, list off all the bits and pieces, so you sort of work your way around the bit, and then you kind of stop. And she sort of knew you knew more, but you didn't say it, so you didn't score the points. Uh, she was a little bit bothered with some of your point form answers because the, there was a lack of clarity. I mean, the points were sort of too pointed, if you like. Uh, so perhaps that might not be the best way to, to say everything you know for the final exam. And that's really the point of the midterm, is to get the format that I use and what the TA is looking for in, in the various answers. Um, so anyway, just sort of clarify things. And, and to be honest, another problem is, that particularly the people who scored rather poorly, uh, was a lack of, of English, uh, and this is a university, an English thing, you, you've got to improve your English, because this is, again, this is second year. If, if, you, if you have a difficult time getting through this year, it's going to get harder and harder, and, and the, you know, the, the expectations are going to be much more specific later on, so I, you, know, you really should work very hard at improving your English. Stop hanging around with all your Korean friends and not, I mean, I said, years ago I said to one girl who's Terrible English. 
Uh, and I said, well, you've got to get yourself an, uh, an English-speaking boyfriend. And, and did I tell you this? And, and you know, that, and you have to speak English. He said, well, that's a good idea, but my husband wouldn't approve. <laughs> so again, I have to be a little bit careful of the advice I hand out these days. But I know half of you, you go home with 